Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the fifth in our annual series of lectures on public policy, which has been endowed at the Institute. Today, our speaker is Maud Barlow, who is national chair of the Council of Canadians and chair of the Washington-based Water and Food Watch, an organization that works to ensure that food, water, and fish are being consumed around the world are safe, accessible, and sustainably produced. Maud is a graduate of Carleton University in Ottawa and also the recipient of 11 honorary doctorates. In 1985, she was a founding member of the Council of Canadians and has been its chair since 1988. She is a founding board member of the International Forum on Globalization, which comprises international activists, scholars, writers, and economists dedicated to creating sustainable alternatives to economic globalization. She's the recipient of very many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award and the 2011 Earth Care Award, the highest international honor of the Sierra Club. She's also the author, author of some 16 books, including the international bestseller, Blue Covenant, The Global Water Crisis and the Coming Battle for the Right to Water. And that is her title this evening. And I'm very pleased to welcome Maud Barlow. Thank you, Dr. Goddard, and thank you very much, all of you, for um, being here and for, um, maybe you don't know that you had patients, but actually, I just arrived <laughs> like seconds ago. I was in, I live in Ottawa, Canada, but I was in Buffalo speaking at the university last night and was to take a plane um, late morning here, <clears throat> and just about everything that co could go wrong went wrong from the plane coming in late from Newark, and then they didn't have pilots, and we had to wait for another late plane to come in, and the pilot shifted, and then there was a mechanical worry, and we all sat in the plane, and then they took us off and put us back on, and we're all ready to go, and there was a snow squall. It was like <clears throat> and I, I kept thinking, it's not like I can be here at six, you know, here's the time to be here. So I'm extra delighted um, to be with you tonight. I'm going to talk at you for a little while, and then hopefully we'll have some time to talk together. I've uh, spent a great deal of um, the last two decades fussing about the global water crisis. Started off really with um, a concern around the fact that water was included in the first free trade agreement in the world, which was the Canada-US free trade agreement, which preceded NAFTA. And uh, <clears throat> I remember thinking, why is water in there as a tradable good? And that started a journey for me asking the question, the political questions around water. Who, you know, who makes decisions around it? Who's controlling it? Um, and it was a journey that's been a very exciting one. It's taken me to all sorts of corners of the earth and from powerful institutions like the UN, where I was honored to be the senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the General Assembly, to poor communities in my country and um, all over the world. So it's really a, a, an interesting um, kind of work that I do. And we've been fighting very, very hard for the right to water and have succeeded in getting the General, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations to recognize it, which I'll talk a wee bit more about. But that's been the struggle that I've been involved in and it started with this, uh, this question, this question about, and this journey on this question. So. I'm just going to describe briefly the, the, the global water crisis, and it was funny being in Buffalo last night. It rained like the end of the earth, really. We were, <laughs> there we were on Lake Erie with this rain, and I'm saying, there's a global water crisis. Everybody, yeah, yeah, right. It was in the paper today. They had quite a good story in the, the Buffalo News, but all the comments were, is she crazy? What's she talking about? There's nothing but water here, right? So, uh, But really, here is a story that we need to understand. You hear about the end of energy or the end of conventional oil in any case, but the, the real crisis in our world is around water. We all learned back in about grade six or whatever, and they still teach this some places, that there's no way that you can run out of, of water, that we have a finite amount of water in the hydrologic cycle and it goes round and round and it can't, it can't go anywhere, except we know that we can hurt it by polluting it, but we don't understand, we haven't understood that maybe it can go somewhere we haven't understood. 
But in fact, we are a planet now running out of fresh water sources, the water somewhere on the planet, but we're either polluting it or diverting it or moving it from where we can access it to where we cannot at an absolutely astounding rate using modern technology that we didn't have um, 50 years ago. First of all, we're polluting. Um, we, are, uh, we put a, a combination of sewage and toxins into the world's rivers and streams and lakes every year equal to the weight of the full seven million, uh, billion of us on the planet. Um, we are also um, distracting and extracting water. We are um, displacing water. And, and displacing our rivers. Uh, we're extracting our rivers to death um, in order to irrigate um, for the global food trade. And we need, you need to know that 70% of all water that we use is used in food production. So as our, our population is growing and the sophistication of the type of food people are demanding and the global movement of, of food and commodities is actually the movement and displacement of water. It's a very important concept you're going to hear more about in the next few years called virtual water. And that virtual water is the water that is used to produce or grow something, usually commodities. And then if you export that commodity out of your watershed or out of your country, you're actually exporting the water. You don't think of it as export of water. We think about export of water as being a pipeline that you put into a lake or whatever. But in fact, the virtual water trade is something we need to uh, have a better handle on. We've just done a study in Canada on our virtual water trade. We're a net virtual water exporter, as is the United States, as is Australia. Um, and Brazil is the fourth major, major uh, exporter of virtual water. They do it through biofuels, because they're growing biofuels with sugarcane and displacing their water that way. But Americans are amazed when I tell them that you use, and you have a crisis of water in parts of this country, a very serious one, that you use um, fully one third of all your domestic water consumption every day is used to grow crops that are then exported out of the country. So a fully a third of your domestic water use every single day it leaves your country and it's mostly from states that don't have the water to be able to afford that in the first place. So it's a very, very serious um, issue and, and one that you're going to hear a lot more about in the coming years. And then we, we're pumping groundwater and we're using technology, deep bore well technology that we didn't have 30, 40, 50 years ago. We're putting bore well technology into, into, into the ground, into springs and, and aquifers that go as deep into the ground as Chicago skyscrapers go into the air, into the sky. And, and we are pulling that water up so ferociously that in places we're actually coming to the bottom of the, of the table, but we're not monitoring it generally. Um, there was a, a, a very distressing study by the uh, US Geological Survey two, three summers ago that found that the pumping of these bore wells in Lake Michigan was so intense, it's on the US side, was so intense that for the first time, in, instead of pumping the groundwater that feeds Lake Michigan, these bore wells were actually pumping the actual water back out of Lake Michigan, reversing the flow of, of Lake Michigan for the first time. Um, there was a, a recent study on uh, groundwater takings. I call it groundwater mining because very often it's like a gold mining company comes in and they take all the gold till it's gone and this will happen in, in these aquifers. And this study said that we've doubled the amount of groundwater use in the last 40 years, but we're exponentially um, doubling it again. So it'll be much, much quicker. The next doubling will be much quicker than, um, uh, than 20 years. And what this study said was that if we're, uh, if, we're t if we're extracting from the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes groundwater as quickly as we're extracting around the world, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years, which I think is just an astonishing uh, statistic. And, and when that study came out, it was, put, it was, in the, it was originally came out in the, in the journal uh, Nature, but uh, it should, in my opinion, have been on the front page of, of every of, of every single uh, newspaper in, in the country here. And uh, another recent statement that's come out of the US uh, Department of Agriculture, this is the Ogallala Aquifer Center um, that's, that's studying the, the Ogallala, which was once the biggest aquifer in the world, we think, um, and is now only producing half the food it was producing in the 1970s. They're saying, officially, it will be gone 
the Ogallala Aquifer will be gone probably within our lifetime unless there's some huge conservation that quickly takes place and there will be no substantial food production on the Great Plains of the United States. Now, I don't know how we can go through election after election and not have a debate about this. I find this just mind-boggling and, uh, and it is one of the reasons, as you know probably, that we stopped, we were able to stop the Keystone Pipeline and taking dirty oil from my country up in Alberta's tar sands and moving it down to Texas. We were able to reroute it at least um, not over the, the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, but we're, we're not conscious of this water. I call it a myth of abundance. We think that we have all the water in the world. We human, humans and the more sophisticated we become, the more this is true. We think of water as being something for our pleasure, our profit, and our convenience. And so we do whatever we want with it. And we don't stop and think, no, it's actually the most essential element of a living ecosystem. And we have to start protecting it and seeing it in a totally different way. So another thing that we're doing with water globally, this is very important, is that we're taking massive amounts of land-based water and we're moving to them to big thirsty cities. And remember now, more of us are living in cities than in rural communities around the world now. And some of these cities are 20, 25, 30 million people and they're thirsty. And the more wealthy they are, the thirstier they are because we know that although population is growing and now the numbers are higher than we thought they were going to be before they peak, Water use is growing at double the rate of population growth. So we're, we're, the more sophisticated, urbanized, and consumer-oriented we, consumer -oriented we become, the more water we consume. So what we know is that we're taking land-based water and we're moving it massively through big cities. And when we're finished with it in those big cities, we tend to dump it in the ocean if they're anywhere near the ocean, and most cities, large cities are often untreated, but we're not returning it to the land-based systems. And, and we are drying up the earth in, in this manner. There are over 100 countries in the world that are experiencing desertification um, as we speak. Uh, and so we are creating a system where we're draining the water out of the land-based land systems. And um, it is one of the, the reasons, the causes for growing um, the rising oceans. And in fact, this groundwater study that I was telling you about actually said that uh, probably at least a quarter of the cause of rising oceans is the displacement of land-based water through the dumping of this water in, through, through cities, not traditional climate change as we have, have understood it. I, the image I use, and I've used this with all age groups, I, I, I use it with kids and they get it, but I still think it's a good image for any age group. Our, our destruction of aquifers is kind of, and our lack of knowledge about them, is kind of like uh, a bunch of people sitting around a, a bathtub, and the bathtub is full of water, and they have blindfolds on, and they have straws, and they're all drinking this water up as fast as they can. And you know what? There's lots of water for everybody until the moment when there's no water left. And this is what's happening in countries around the world. We're hearing that it's drought, but in fact, the correct terminology for m many parts of the world is that they're actually running out of water. China is using its abundant water sources to produce all the toys and rubber duckies and everything for the world. And they are experiencing huge desertification, uh, 4,000 cities. Uh, cities and towns, but most of them are, are larger cities now, are, are um, at risk of, 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 of being taken over by the desert. Um, India, the, the water table in Mumbai is, is gone. I mean, we, you know, the stories from India, a combination of terrible pollution of the waterways. I mean, we're talking 75% of all surface water in India, 75% in, in uh, Russia, 85% in China. All the surface water of these countries is polluted. Um, but we're also talking about the end of the groundwater that uh, systems that they have. Australia, Australia has depended on mostly on the Murray Darling River. Murray Darling River stopped reaching the ocean a couple of years ago. They have had some floods and there's been a bit of replenishment, but they're, they're draining that water. And this is for virtual water uh, food production because huge agribusinesses suck that water up higher up the Murray Darling and they produce cotton and rice and they grow the grapes for, for, for wine and they export it all over the, the world. Um, and and uh, uh, Australia is, has hit the water wall. Um, 
22 countries in Africa are in crisis right now. Um, one in three people in Africa doesn't have uh, adequate access to water. If we continue, as you know, all predictions are, over the next 10 to 15 years, as the United Nations, we will add uh, that will become one in two uh, people in Africa not having access. Um, and Mexico City sinking on itself. They've taken up all the water underneath the city and uh, are now uh, having to, to, to look at, um, long distances away to, to take water. So we are, and the United States has very serious issues. Uh, the, the southwest, the southeast, and even parts of the northeast now, I, I think we, we're going to have to recognize um, really serious crises. Yes, there are the Great Lakes, and, and you know that's the great uh, factor here in the United States, but there is also a, a compact that says that that water cannot be exported off the basin. So it's not as if that's going to relieve the, the crisis in other parts of, of this country. So as we, oh, and just to tell you the latest study, and, and um, I do have some good thoughts, but I do think eventually, but I, I do feel it's important for us to get the, the feel of what we're dealing with here. Um, this is a study that was done uh, by the big water users, the bottled water companies, the big food producers, and so on, and they um, have, uh, they did a study last year and they said that, the, that just again at current demand, not growing, and we know the demand is growing, but just at current demand by 2030, the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%. Now I, I can't even begin to tell you the suffering that, that this is going to cause in, in huge parts of the world. If you look at the graph, the arrow is going straight up in terms of, of the demand and the supply is going straight down. So we are a, wa a world, we are a planet running out of water. It is distributed in inequitably or unevenly, of course, and so not everywhere is running out of water at all times, but we are a planet in very serious trouble. So not surprisingly, there are conflicts over this um, uh, growing uh, ecological crisis. Um, I guess the most obvious is the difference between rich and poor. And if you're wealthy in our world, or even in a water-scarce country, if you're wealthy, you can have all the, the water that you don't need for your wash your cars and your swimming pools and your golf courses and so on. I remember going to the Rio Plus 10 in, San, in, uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Rio Plus 20 is coming up in, in uh, Brazil in June, but 10 years ago we all met in, in Johannesburg, and it was held in a very luxurious, gorgeous area of Johannesburg with, you know, five-star hotels. If they could have been 10-star, they would have, and, you know, gorgeous restaurants and, and boutique water everywhere, and, uh, and just right there between uh, uh, Sandton and, and uh, this place called Orange Farm, the one next to it, or Alexander, the, they had a, a, a poison river that had cholera warning signs on it. And right across there, in, with, you could see, I mean, just literally as close as you could see, people with absolutely no running water, uh, you know, no, no potable water whatsoever. Um, but it's important for you, and, and it's important to know that uh, the lack of clean water is the biggest killer of children in our world. Um, every three and a half seconds, uh, a child dies in the global south now. This is a new study from the World Health Organization. But it's important for you to know that it isn't just in poor countries anymore, that as water becomes more scarce, as we become more divided, rich and poor, which is what all the occupations are about, right? Um, and as the price of water is starting to go up, we're finding people being denied water in rich countries as well. Detroit, Michigan has uh, turned the water off to close to 90,000 families, mostly African American, a lot of elderly people and single mothers, and they are living in literally third world conditions. I mean, I've been there, I've seen the conditions they're living under, and it's not really any different than what I saw in South Africa or Bolivia or um, et cetera, many places we go. Um, there's also conflict coming as nation states seek water sources outside their borders, just the way they're now seeking energy sources. So you get China taking the water from the Tibetan Himalayas that now feeds all the major rivers of Asia, 
and they're taking it by pipeline and dams and diversions and just helping themselves to that water because they've claimed Tibet. And India is very upset, and there are people who watch that part of the world very closely who are very concerned that there's going to be a conflict over water between uh, China and India. Um, we get land grabs, which are partly for the land, but also very much for the water. Uh, there's an area twice the size of Great Britain that's been bought up by rich countries and rich investors in Africa alone. And it's for the land and for the water, and they take the best water. This is the story of the Horn of Africa. It's not the story everybody talks about, you know, population, poor government, no rain. It's, this is much more the story. Big agribusiness, big investment in, this, in, this, uh, in this, these land grabs uh, use, using the local water to, buy, to grow food that they then export back to their home countries. That's a much more uh, common story. I remember being in, um, in a place called Lake Naivasha in, in uh, Kenya, and uh, the most beautiful lake you can't imagine in the Rift Valley, and went out on a, an old wooden boat with an old, uh, a Maasai elder, a great tall man who, who paddled standing up with this old, old paddle, and we went by hippopotamus herd, and he said, don't get close, and how mean they were. And I looked at an island, and it was it had wildebeests, and you know, it was giraffes, it was gorgeous. And I said, you know, that looks just like the movie Out of Africa. And he said, that would be because that's where Out of Africa was filmed, right there. So, and so you could almost see Robert Redford landing his plane and Meryl Streep waiting for him. But this lake, which used to belong to the Maasai people, is now surrounded by European rose companies in agribusiness, agribusiness companies growing roses for export back to Europe, because Europe's saving its water by growing its food and flowers and so on in, Europe, in uh, Africa. And this lovely lake where Robert Redford and Meryl Streep made that lovely movie is dying. The hippopotamus are dying. They say the lake will be gone in maybe 10 years. You know, it, this is a story that we need to understand when we, you know, when we look at our lives and our lifestyles. And we need to, we need to know that the search for water now is forming a new kind of colonialism, a very dangerous kind. I was in uh, Florianapolis, Brazil two weeks ago and speaking at the first Congress on protecting the water of the Mercosur countries and they have the Guarani Aquifer there and the Guarani is probably now the biggest aquifer in the world. It used to, they think it used to be the Ogallala but now it's probably the biggest. Basically, I said to them, unless you move really quickly to take control of it and to name it as a commons that belongs to your people and so on, you're going to find that water plundered. You've already got the big energy companies coming in and taking over the sugarcane fields and controlling the water. You've got the big water companies coming in. I mean, there is plunder taking place where any, uh, any of these water sources exist. We're also seeing conflict between large urban centers and rural communities, indigenous, peasant, tribal people, and nature, where to feed the enormous appetite, the enormous thirst uh, in these cities, they're now putting pipelines far away from the city, confiscating water that belongs to the local people, and literally stealing water from indigenous communities. Um, Mexico City has put a pipeline into an indigenous community called the Basalos, and they have just literally confiscated the water, put a great big fortress around the water source. They have armed guards and dogs guarding that water. And some of the women in the local community started taking access to the pipeline, the way the Ogoni people did in, in Nigeria with, with shell oil, and just, just as a, a, a form of protest. Others have gone on, on a hunger strike. I mean, literally, they just came and, and, and took their water. But I guess the, the, the conflict or the, the struggle I've been most involved in is the one between those who say that the answer to the world's water crisis is to name it as a commodity, to put it on the open market for sale like running shoes or more appropriately maybe energy, and put it on the stock exchange. And those who say, no, it's a common heritage of all humanity, we must protect it as a commons and a public trust and a human right. And you might not be surprised to know that's the side that I'm on. Uh, but it's a very, very big struggle. Um, the, there are huge corporations in the world, big private interests, who figured out before a lot of the rest of us 
that water was going to become very scarce and the demand was going to go up and therefore the price was going to go up and therefore anybody who controlled it was going to be both powerful and perhaps wealthy. Um, the, there's a, a, an investor who spoke at a big conference in London, England last year on, on the world water crisis and he, he gave all the stats and how terrible it is, blah, blah, and then he said, but there's buckets and buckets of money to be made <laughs> from the crisis. I thought, a little crude, you know, but honest anyway. So what kinds of, of, uh, of, 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 of um, uh, you know, what kinds of, of, of uh, privatization are we seeing? Well, there's the, the, the uh, for-profit uh, utilities that come in. Very often the World Bank will say to a poor country, if you want water funding for your... For your projects, you have to take Veolia or Suez, one of the big companies from Europe, and you have to uh, let them run it on a for-profit basis. And then they raise the rate of, of, of the funding, of the, the water rates, and millions uh, of people um, get absolutely um, cut off. We've had uh, uh, so many stories, so many terrible stories, really, in terms of of uh, the, the cutoffs around the world and the millions of people who've been, you know, just had their rights removed. Um, I remember standing in, in Orange Farm, one of those uh, townships in, in uh, South Africa, and where they had terrible poverty, um, oops, my thing just came out here, just a sec, where they had terrible poverty, and, uh, sorry, how's that? Uh, no running water, um, uh, you know, rats in the gutters, kids without shoes, the whole thing, burning tires, as far as you can see poverty, but suddenly the miracle of a pipe and a tap coming up to every block of these hovels, nothing very fancy or expensive, but, you know, just finally water. But between the pipe and the tap is a state-of-the-art water meter. And the only way you can get the water is to get an electronic key charged up, which you have to pay for, and then you touch the water meter and it literally charges you for every single drop of water. And I remember standing there with a wonderful activist whose name is Brook, uh, Brix Mukolo, and he said, kind of gives new meaning to the old concept of water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Because we have 80% unemployment in this community and nobody can afford this water. And so we look at these taps, and all run by Suez from France. We, we look at these taps, and our women take their buckets on their heads, and they walk the five miles to the contaminated water, and they bring it back, and that's why our kids are dying. So it's not that the water isn't there, but it isn't accessible um, to the people who need it. Uh, we're also seeing something called water markets, and water markets are where you transfer or transform a, a, a license into a, uh, a, a, mar a property. And basically you say that it's a water right. And then you allow the private trading internally. Um, Australia did this. A, a conservative government in 1993 converted all the licenses to property, basically water rights, to be traded. And so all these big agribusiness companies had this windfall. They were paying for this water one day, and the next day they owned it. Um, and they started, uh, the idea was that they would use it more efficiently, and if they saved some, they could sell it, so that would make them use it more carefully. What really happened was they started buying up smaller farmers, and then the investors started coming in and buying the water up, and then international investors started coming in and buying the water up, and the price of water went through the roof. When the Labour government came in 10 years later, they, not quite 10 years later, eight years later, whatever, they started to try to buy the water back to replenish the Murray Darling and were unable to do it uh, because they couldn't afford to buy this back. And now you have farmers in Australia, a first so-called first world country, growing crops that investors are telling them to grow. They're not able to make their own um, choices for themselves. Uh, so we, you know, we are seeing the, the, um, uh, the enclosure, if you will, of the commons, uh, what has been considered a, a water commons by these big companies. And I don't know where it's going to end. I do know that in the United States, it depends on whether you live in the west or the east, which kind of uh, regime you have around water. It tends to be more water privatization, water rights in the West, and more of water as a, a, a public trust in the East. T. Boone Pickens is, uh, you probably know, as a gazillionaire, whatever, from uh, Texas, who's buying up water from the Ogallala 
and he's just holding on to it till it's worth even more than it's worth now. And one of my books on water I call Blue Gold because I think we need to understand that it's like black gold, only this is blue gold. Chile has gone so far as to have public auctions of the actual water. And so companies like mining companies from Canada come in from, from abroad, come in, you know, the foreign investors, and they compete, they, uh, you know, they negotiate, they compete against small farmers, local indigenous communities, small villages, and if they win, they have that water. They can use it to dump their toxins in, they can move it where they want, they physically, literally own the water. India is selling whole uh, river systems because they're desperately broke, and the more we see governments uh, through these austerity programs having to cut, you know, cut back and back and back in terms of their role, the more we're seeing uh, the private sector coming in and buying up what used to be considered common uh, property, like, well, the Greeks are selling a bunch of islands, they're selling their water system, um, et cetera. So this is a struggle that a lot of us have been involved in, and so I want to talk a little bit about what I think we can do um, about this crisis, because I see it as both ecological and human. And I want to say that I, I believe it's very important that we have an analysis that takes the ecological and human crisis together, and also a set of responses that puts them together. When I first came into this work, I saw two separate tra trails, you know, two separate uh, sets of, of groups working. There were the people working on the humanitarian, development area, worried about poverty, justice, the poor, uh, and, and that was their thing, you know, justice for water, water justice. And then on the other side are scientists and environmentalists who are saying we're running out of water, we're destroying the world's water, but they weren't working together. And I say to people sometimes, you know, you give money to a charity that goes in and builds wells in a poor community, and, and I understand why you do that, but that might not be the answer, they might not have the groundwater and we should not be destroying our surface water and assuming that there's endless groundwater um, there to replenish. So we need to build an analysis and a set of, of responses um, that put these two, uh, uh, the, that merge these two paths. And I'm going to suggest that a water secure future is dependent on three fundamental principles. The first is that water itself has rights and we have got to change our relationship to water We've got to go back and learn what indigenous peoples knew and know about water and start building our lives and our work around water and not the other way around. There are really two paths we can have, we can choose to, to deal with the water crisis. There's what we call the hard path. That's big technology, that's desalination, which is expensive, energy intensive and puts a polluting brine back into the ocean, but it is a big answer in a lot of wealthy countries. There are 25 desal plants planned for the coast of California alone. Uh, big dams, big fancy urban, uh, you know, water, water treatment, chemical water treatment recycling programs, the, 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 big, the big stuff. As one colleague of mine says, the World Bank knows how to spend a billion dollars in one place on these big technologies, but they don't know how to spend a million dollars in a thousand places or a thousand dollars in a million places, even better, which is often the more appropriate tech, uh, technology. Um, or we can go what's, uh, what many of us call the soft path, and the soft path is the following. It's watershed protection and restoration. It's conservation, conservation, conservation. And one of my worries about corporate control of water is that you, if there's money to be made in the recycling of dirty water, it might just not be a priority to get the government to stop the pollution, right? Because there's all sorts of money to be made from polluted water. Um, protection of source water is incredibly important. Um, that we've got to stop over extracting and overmining our groundwater. We have to understand the, the, the link between extraction and recharge, and we, we, we've, we know what to do, we're not doing it. Uh, we have to prosecute polluters. Uh, I consider it to be one of the greatest crimes anyone can commit to pollute water and destroy water that other people need for life. On the Canadian side of Lake Erie, there's a, a city called Sarnia, and there's a First Nations community there they call it Chemical Valley, it's just an awful place in terms of the pollution. 
And the, this First Nations, the Amjawang people, have had for the last decade or so, have had twice as many girl babies born as boy babies because of the, the poison um, in the water there. Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless, which I think is an absolutely lovely um, statement. We need to harvest rainwater. We need to harvest stormwater. We need to invest in our infrastructure, and many of our municipalities are broke and, and don't, know how, don't have the money to do that. We need to cut our virtual water footprint, our virtual water export, and that's going to be moving, need us to move to local sustainable food production, which may be one of the most important things we can do to save water. It uses water differently. We know traditional farming, farming that's more ecologically sound, is one of the answers to climate change. It's, it's one of the answers to saving water. But that's going to mean that we're going to come smack up against our government's enthusiasm for all these big free trade agreements, you know, more trade, more stuff, more global food trade, uh, more water being destroyed around the world. Um, and a lot of us are working now on a, a concept called the rights of nature or the rights of Mother Earth. Um, and we say that we need a body of law to regulate human behavior in order to protect the integrity of the earth and, and all species upon it. That basically nature is considered property in Western law. And that's an incompatible legal framework to the legal framework um, or the, the, nat the laws of nature, the natural laws um, of our ecosystems. And we believe that our human rights must be balanced against the rights of ecosystems. I'm going to read to you um, just one quote from a wonderful man whose name is Cormac Cullinan. And he is a human rights and environmental lawyer in Cape Town, um, South Africa. And he says, the day will come when the failure of our laws to recognize the right of a river to flow to prohibit acts that destabilize the Earth's climate or to impose a duty to respect the intrinsic value and right to exist of all life will be as reprehensible as allowing people to be bought and sold. We will only flourish by changing these systems and claiming our identity as well as assuming our responsibilities as members of the Earth community. I mean, just imagine if the Gulf could sue BP. I mean, why do we think why do we think in such narrow ways that right now the only entities that can sue BP are either individuals or businesses that have been directly affected and losing money from that spill but what about the ecosystem what about future generations what about the aquatic life um, what about just the general population that lived in there and and loved it we have got to stop seeing, and I repeat this, I've said it once, but I'll say it again, we've got to stop seeing water as, and all of nature as a big resource for us, for our convenience and profit um, and pleasure. We have got to start respecting it in a fundamentally different way. Water is the essential element of a living ecosystem. It gives us life. Without it, we don't live. And without it, many people are dying right now. Um, and a number of us have worked on something called the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. That came out of a wonderful summit in Cochabamba, Bolivia, called by President Evo Morales after the failure of the Copenhagen Climate Summit two years ago, and then, and then there was Cancun, and now it's in Durban, where my government is going to go in and put the knife in Kyoto. Good for my government. I'm really mad at <laughs> them get me talking about my government and I won't, you won't get me off, so I'll stop there. But just to say that um, uh, we had this wonderful session after the failure of Copenhagen. Copenhagen, when you got off the plane, this is you know the UN summit on climate change, when you get off the plane there were little, I called them elves, Coca-Cola elves, people greeting you in little red outfits with Coca-Cola to drink and welcoming you to Copenhagen, which they cleverly called Copenhagen. And uh, all through the city, you saw videos and advertising by Coca-Cola. It was basically the summit, climate summit brought to you by Coca-Cola with happy children running through healthy grasslands and lovely fresh water everywhere. And so I started calling it Copenhagen because <laughs> it just really annoyed me. And I, 
I think I was a little rude to a little elf seeing me off in the airport. I, to this day, I feel badly. I think I barked at a little elf. Um, but uh, so a number of us felt that the failure had to be dealt with. And so Eva Morales invited the climate justice movement. And we came to Cochabamba. They expected seven or 8,000, something like 39,000 of us came. And, out of it came the Declaration, um, Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, which we presented, a few of us, the next week to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, and uh, which we hope and dream one day will become a companion piece to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So that's the first principle, is that we've got to start respecting water. The second principle that I would pose to you is that water is a commons and a public trust, and that we need to bring in watershed-wide planning, and that's, it's gotta be at least 50 years per watershed, that clarifies the ownership of water, and that is that water belongs to the people of that watershed and also belongs to the future, and also belongs to the ecosystem. Many of us are worried about what we call the modern enclosure of the commons. The commons is a very old concept. Um, in, in Great Britain in the 1700s, they brought in laws to uh, uh, kill the access of the peasants to graze and hunt and fish on nobil noble land, nobility land. And I don't know if you remember the old um, nursery rhyme, they hang the man and flog the woman that steal the goose from off the common, but lets the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. This was a, a nursery rhyme about have, removing the common from the people and, and, uh, and you know, those who got to, to stay with it um, and to own it uh, once it's free of that common property were even wealthier and more powerful than ever. While a number of us talk about the enclosure of the modern commons being the assault on air and water and oceans and the privatization of, of what used to be considered um, public space. Um, and the modern, I, I would argue that the commons is based on the notion that certain, certain areas of, of our life, and in this case natural resources, particularly air, water, and oceans, are central to our very existence. And therefore, governments must exercise their fiduciary obligation to sustain the essence of these resources for the long-term use and enjoyment of the entire populace, not just a privileged few. And that would be the, the notion of, of saying that, that our waters are a, are a commons, a common heritage. Public trust doctrine, then, is the legal framework that entrenches these common rights in law. And there's a very rich history of uh, the commons in, here in the United States. And something I'm very familiar with and very proud of is work I did in Vermont. Vermont had no protection for its groundwater up until a few years ago. And they were seeing a number of company, companies, particularly bottled water companies, coming in and putting their uh, you know, their bore wells down into their pipes down into the, the aquifers and just taking the water up and local water sources were drying up. So they brought in legislation and it's really nice. It was jointly uh, presented to the, to the legislature by a Democratic state, uh, Democratic senator, um, state senator and a Republican state senator, both women, very nice. Um, to, uh, to declare their water as a public trust, and it, it was adopted unanimously almost four years ago. And I like this legislation because it's, it explains what a public trust is. It says that it, the, this, their groundwater and their surface water belongs to the people of Vermont, belongs to the future, and belongs to the ecosystem. And they even go so far as to say if there's going to be a time of you know, having to make decisions around water, if there's scarcity, if there are concerns, that they will have, they will have, they will give access first priority to drinking water for all, uh, water for ecosystem protection, and local sustainable food production. So you actually can name it um, quite specifically. A number of us are working now on a very exciting project called um, the Great, uh, we're calling it the Great Lakes Commons Basin. We want, or Great Lakes Basin Commons. And I, uh, we've written a report, I have written a report, which if you're interested in, you can get either at my uh, organization in Canada, canadians.org, or go to foodandwaterwatch.org. I chair the board of Food and Water Watch here in the United States, and we work very closely together. 
and our organizations and a number of others are going to launch in the spring a project around the Great Lakes to get the people involved in a, in a project to take back the Great Lakes, if you will, um, where we've got you know, many wonderful environmental groups and we have treaties and so on between our two countries, but the Great Lakes are in terrible trouble. We're extracting more water every day than we're putting back. We have invasive species, we have multiple pollution, and now we have new mining interests, we've got gas, natural gas fracking, and most Americans don't know, we have the dirty energy from Alberta's tar sands coming to 17 refineries through a pipeline called the, the um, Alberta Clipper to 17 refineries on the US side of the Great Lakes. And this is going to be a huge threat to the lakes. So we want the Great Lakes to be named a living commons, a public trust, and a protected bioregion. And we're very excited about this project because we want to take the theory on the commons, which exists out there, and there's some very wonderful work being done by people like Ellen Ostrom and others, but we want to take that and make it um, real and practical. So finally then, the third, my third uh, principle that I would offer you is that we need to agree that water is a human right. Uh, and that might sound like a motherhood to you, but we had an awful battle getting the United Nations to adopt the right to water. Who was against it? All the big water companies, all the big food companies, the World Bank dead set against it, uh, an institution called the World Water Forum, sorry, World Water Council, which holds the World Water Forum every three years and is really just the big companies and the World Bank and a bunch of private interests in water. They just refused over and over. And then countries like mine and yours and England and Australia, a lot of the English speaking um, you know, wealthy countries have resisted this because they don't want an extension of the concept of rights. They, they sort of, that first generation of right, the right not to be tortured and the right to freedom of speech and so on, those they accept, but they don't want an enlargement of the notion of rights. Um, but last um, year and a bit ago, in June of 2010, uh, Pablo Solon, who was then the ambassador from Bolivia to the United Nations, decided he'd had enough. It's a little landlocked country in South America. Their kids are dying. They're having terrible trouble with, with climate change and their glaciers are melting and their seasons are changing and it's very serious. And he put to the United Nations General Assembly unannounced a resolution that the United Nations General Assembly recognized the human right to water and sanitation. And everybody freaked. It was like, we're not ready, we need 20 more years of study. And, he, and then everybody tried to get him to change it and moderate it, and he would not. And he said, I'd rather lose a good, strong statement than win something that didn't have any meaning. And so on July 28, 2010, they voted. The United Nations General Assembly voted on this, and I was there holding my staff's hand. I had a couple of my staff with me and saying, we're not gonna win this. It's okay, we'll be back in five years, well maybe 10, and we'll win it then. This is a historic day just to be here. Boom, they go to the vote, and when they vote there, it comes up on a big electronic board. And so they vote from their chairs, and in favor, 122 countries, not one country abstained, even my own, which was so opposed, uh, or sorry, voted against, 41 abstained, including the US and, and Canada. Um, but it, we overwhelmingly won, and it was great cheering and eruptions and tears and excitement. And it was really interesting then because uh, many countries got up to speak and say what they thought, and they lectured Pablo Solo. They, you know, we didn't, we weren't ready, and you shouldn't have forced us. Some who'd voted for, some who had not, but they all lectured them, all these big countries, Canada and Germany and everybody. And I remember Ambassador Solo standing there with this big kind of shit-eating grin, you know, saying, like, what part of I just won and you didn't, um, do you not get here? It was a, a lovely moment. Um, two months later, uh, the Human Rights Council also adopted a resolution on the human right to water and sanitation, but in this case, they outlined what the responsibilities of governments are. And again, if any of you are interested in this, I've written a report on this called uh, our, our Right to Water, uh, a People's Guide to the Implementation of the human right to, uh, UN Human Right to Water and, and Sanitation, again, on our websites. Um, and the obligations on governments are very clear, uh, and they have to report to the UN, and that means that the, 
the people in Detroit cannot have their water denied to them, and uh, American natives cannot be living uh, in conditions where they don't have clean water, and so on. I mean, there are abuses happening in North America as well. But just to tell you, um, last story, that we did have a test case on, on, uh, on the right to water, and it happened right away, and we were really nervous, because you know, a lot of people, even in our movement, said, why are you bothering with the UN? Ugh, don't forget the UN. And so we were you know, coming up with our, ex our explanations and so on. But um, the Kalahari Bushmen of, of Botswana have had a long-standing uh, feud with their government. And their government has, um, has been removing them. They're embarrassed about them. The, the Prime Minister of Botswana says that the Kalahari Bushmen are an embarrassing anachronism. That's the term he uses, because they still have loincloths and spears, and they still hunt and graze and so on. They live the way their ancestors did. And also, they found diamonds in the Kalahari Desert, and De Beers wants in, right? So they wanted these people out. So about a, um, a decade ago, they started forcibly removing them and putting them in settlement camps around the, the, uh, the, the desert. And the people were drinking and committing suicide, and there were drugs, and it was really terrible. And so they started coming back. So then the government smashed their bore wells and said that if anybody caught trying to open those bore wells um, would be killed, and some people were killed. So with Survival International, a wonderful international organization, the Kalahari Bushmen went to court in 2006. They won the right to go back to the, to the uh, desert, but not to have the right to water. So they appealed. And the week before the United Nations adopted the resolution on the right to water, they lost the right to water appeal at the middle level court in Botswana. But then we had these two resolutions, and armed with these two resolutions, the Kalahari Bushmen and, Inter and Survival International went back to, uh, to uh, the court, this time the Supreme Court of Botswana, and last January we won, they won, we won, and we won that the, they not only have the right to go back to the desert, they have the right to their water, they have, the government has to reopen that water, that bore well, and, and dig others if they need them, and they had the right to restitution, financial restitution from the government. So it was a sweet, sweet moment, and only about a month ago did it finally get reopened, because the government, of course, took as long as it could possibly, and there's a lovely photograph of colleagues that I know standing there, again, with their spears and their headdress and so on, um, drinking water from their bore wells. So it, it's a long struggle that we have ahead of us, and, and having this right recognized does not mean that it will happen overnight around the world. But I believe that our, our human species took a step forward um, that day, uh, and, and uh, evolutionarily, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an evolution um, way. And you should know, by the way, that the United States changed its position on the, when it came to the Human Rights Council vote and supported the right to water. I don't think there was much media here about it, but it was a good thing. So I'm going to end um, the formal part of this, and I'm hoping we still have a few minutes for, for a chat, but with a, a quote from Tolkien. Um, this uh, was a favorite of mine before the movies, but anyway, I loved the movies too. But this is Gandalf, and this is a night when he's seeing, you know, potentially the end, that that terrible army is going to come in and kill everything living, and very much I think this is a story about a, an assault on nature and, and a fight for nature and a fight for life. And uh, Gandalf is talking about being a steward, and I would say that, you know, we need to be stewards of our water. We need to be stewards of our earth. So he says this. He says, the rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril, as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if, if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you very much.